Thunderclouds passed overhead, as dark and swollen as ticks after feeding. Rain fell so heavily that it seemed to blow sideways. Gusts of wind pushed my car to the left and right as I flew down the highway. It could be so cool, my friend chuckles said in his reedy voice, leaning forward in the back seat. Freckles covered his extremely pale face. Reddish-brown hair stuck up all over his head, as if he had shoved a fork into an electrical outlet. Skinny and short, Chuckles was always a pleasure to be around. He never got mad or frustrated, at least as far as I knew. He was always in a good mood and joking around, even when everyone else around him was not. I didn't even know they had caves out here, I responded. My friend, Zack, sat in the passenger seat. He had just lit a cigarette, rolled down the window a crack before trying to flick the ashes outside. The wind grabbed the cigarettes like a child, snatching away a piece of candy. He swore as it flew behind us into the soggy, flooded streets. Shit, this has to be the worst damn time to go splunking, Zack said, his pale cheeks flaring with patches of ruddy color. His straight black hair extended beyond his shoulders, and as usual, he had on a black metal t-shirt. This time, it was some band called Barusum. A woman on the front, wearing traditional peasant garb, held a long viking horn to her mouth, eternally blowing into it as the dark Scandinavian mountains loomed behind her. Sack's inky eyes flared as he stared moodily out the window. We are going to get soaked, even with the raincoats. It's not a very far walk to the cave, Chuckle sat defensively, leaning back in his seat. The map says it's only a mile. That map's so old it probably doesn't know a mite from a mile, Zack responded haughtily. We drove on in silence for a few minutes. I kept a lookout for the exit, squinting through the thick curtains of rain as the lightning boomed above us like the flashes of nuclear missiles. Finally, I sighed as the exit for Union loomed up through the mist. I flicked on the turn signal, even though the highway was totally dead and empty. I hadn't seen another car the entire ride. I hadn't even seen any people. It had all been woods and lakes. According to the map, Union was a tiny town by a population with only four or five hundred people living in it. Yet, by land, it was huge. State parks and forests stretched across its rolling hills and clear, babbling streams. Massive lakes dotted the surface like the craters of a nuclear war. So, how deep is this cave? I asked Chuckles, glaring back at him. But what if it floods during the rain? He rolled his eyes. This isn't like a cave from a Hollywood movie. It might get slick, but it ain't gonna fill up like... Hey, watch out! Zack cried as a small figure in a yellow raincoat zoomed across the road. I slammed on the brakes and spun the wheel, missing the child by mere inches. The tire locked up, and I began to fishtail. I heard Chuckles scream in the back, but my own heartbeat in my ears seemed far louder. The world spun around me. Sheets of rain seemed to hang suspended in the air as everything slowed down. Trees flew up in front of the window. I felt my hands on the steering wheel, knuckles turning white as I clenched it to my frozen fingers. A crunching, rending explosion rang out like the sound of shattering bones. I felt myself thrown forward, the seatbelt pulling me back with its iron grip. And then we stopped. Everything went dead silent for a moment. All I could hear in the car was our breathing, fast and panicked. Jesus Christ! Chuckles yelled. He threw on his raincoat before opening the door and jumping out. Zack sat in his seat, his face pale, his whole body trembling. I still had my fingers wrapped around the steering wheel in a death grip. Clouds of smoke rose up from the front of the car as the engine hissed like a snake. I felt disassociated, like a man in a fugue state. I turned off the car and opened the door, slowly getting out after putting on a raincoat. Zack did the same running his fingers through his hair and shaking his head as if trying to clear it. Well, that sucks, Chuckles said, looking down at the passenger's side wheel. I walked around the hood, seeing the stone, 
seeing that a stone the size of a basketball had pushed the tire and rotors straight up into the frame of the car. The metal looked like a broken accordion, twisted and slanted. Liquid streamed out from under the hood, draining into the black dirt and weeds below. It looked like coolant, but I wasn't sure. I don't know anything about cars. What the fuck was that all about? Zack said, still shaky. His voice seemed to waver. Was that kid playing chicken on the street? I just shook my head, looking over toward the road. All up and down it, I only saw dark forest. The branches of the trees whipped crazily under the power of the thunderstorm. I pulled out my cell phone, swearing when I saw I had no service. We were truly in the middle of nowhere. I heaved a deep sigh, looking up. Chuckles was kneeling down in front of the tire, trying to peer under the car. This is going to need to get towed, Chuckles said, stating the obvious. I started to calm down, realizing that the situation could have been a lot worse. I could have killed the kid, after all, or smashed into a tree and killed one of my friends or myself. We're going to need to walk and find a house, I said, going back to the car for umbrellas. Zack looked down at the ground, frowning. I followed his gaze, seeing a snake slithering around his feet. It jerked mechanically, twisting its body in strange figure eights. Its skin gleamed black like that of a water snake. But it had no eyes, and its mouth looked toothless. Zack reached down and picked it up by the neck. Don't! I yelled, but he gave me a sideways glance. I've been picking up snakes since I was a kid, he said. The trick is to grab them by the neck, right below their heads, so they can't twist around and bite you. Not that we really have any venomous ones up here anyway, except for an occasional water moccasin. But I... He stopped, suddenly, as the snake's head popped off in its hands. The body immediately stopped its strange twisting and jerking. I took a step back, aghast at what I saw. The snake had gears and wires and cables running through its thin body. It was some sort of machine. We started walking, then. A rising, nervous energy filling our group. Even Chuckles seemed uncharacteristically spooked and quiet. What the hell is that thing? Zack wondered aloud, peering into the open mouth. It had no tongue, no teeth. Just a smooth, plasticky black hole leading inwards. I, I bet it's some kid's toy. Chuckles exclaimed suddenly. Yeah, obviously. It's just some kid's stupid RV toy. I bet it's the same kid who ran into the street. He's probably watching us, uh, messing with us right now. He's driving fake snakes into... He stopped abruptly, his eyes widening as he looked ahead on the road. Hundreds of the black, eyeless snakes skittered and writhed across its surface, twisting as if their spines were snapped. As we got closer, I could hear gears whirring and grinding. It was hard to hear over the roar of the rain, but the sound was definitely there. I heard a snapping of twigs to my right in the forest. Looking over, I saw two silvery eyes peering out of the thick brush, so far away that they were almost entirely obscured by the fog. The skin around them appeared dead and white like bleached bones, but the bushes blocked most of the creature's body and face. It was as if it was peeking at us. When it saw me looking, it quickly ducked down, disappearing from view. I think I just saw something, I whispered, but my friends paid no attention. They were staring at the snakes, with their mouths open. Zack threw the head and body to the side, went to the group of them, and grabbed another one. Its head also came off with a popping sound, showing more gears and metal. What is this place? Zack asked in wonder. Guys, I saw something in the woods, I said louder. Something's watching us, and it didn't look like a human. Maybe an animal, I, I don't know. Chuckles and Zack looked increasingly nervous. I listened to the rhythmic pattering of the rain on my plastic coat, feeling how my heart raced, beating in my ears at a frenetic pace. 
The others are just machines anyway, Zack said dismissively, deciding to step through the pile of mechanical snakes. But as soon as he stepped on the first one, it twisted its body. Its shiny, eyeless head snapped around in a blur. Two hypodermic needles shot out of its mouth, flicking out like the teeth of a rattlesnake. It clamped down on Zack's leg, shaking its head like a rabid dog. Zack shrieked in surprise and pain, quickly stepping back and falling. I caught him. Chuckles reached out and pulled the snake by the tail. Its body came off, but the head stayed attached to Zack's leg, like a tick's head stuck deep in the flesh. God, get it off! Damn it, get this fucking thing off my leg! He screamed, flailing and circling. It burns! It burns! God, it burns! Chuckles reached forward, trying to pry the jaws open, but the head remained firmly stuck, the needles biting deep into his muscle. I ran forward, with the combined strength of Chuckles and myself, we finally were able to pry the jaws loose. As the needles came out with a sucking sound, I saw drops of something falling out of their hollow ends. There was a sluggish, thick liquid that looked as blue as cyanide and shimmered like opals. Zack's eyes began to roll back in his head. Chuckles threw the now still snake head off the side of the road and ran forward, catching Zack as he fell. I grabbed his arm, and we began to drag him back towards the car, away from these eerie mechanical creatures. He started coughing up great gouts of blood. It streamed in thick jets from his mouth. Only the whites of his eyes shone in his pale, bloodless face. He began to kick and flail, his lips and fingernails took on a bluish cast. We laid him down on the pavement, and watched him die. Whatever poison was in those snakes, it was rapid-acting and lethal. The entire process had taken less than twenty seconds. Oh, Jesus. I think he's dead, man. Chuckle said, sweating heavily. What the hell is this place? We need to get out of this town, or we'll start walking back towards the highway and flag down a car. I nodded, feeling shell-shocked and sick. I didn't point out that we hadn't seen any cars. I watched Zack's face as blue, cyanotic streaks ran down his neck and up his arms. He exhaled a final time, a long, choking breath. His body stayed stiff and twisted in death like a man dying of tetanus. His mouth remained open in a silent scream. I can't believe it, I said simply, staring down at Zack's body. His sleeve had pulled up in his death throes, and I saw what looked like a tattoo of numbers. They reminded me of tattoos I had seen on pictures of inmates who survived death camps. I knelt down, pulling the sleeve up. It was just plain black numbers on the bottom of his arm, reading 402202. I was about to say something to Chuckles when something pale moved out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw a child standing at the edge of the forest. His face looked like it was painted chalk white. He had no hair on his body that I could see. His lipless mouth pulled apart in a silent grin showing blackened gums and sharp, filthy teeth. The eyes reflected the dim light pouring in through the thunderclouds. They shone like a tarnished mirror, darkly. He raised his thin, emaciated finger and pointed at us, laughing silently like some demonic mime. His white face cracked into an expression of glee. He rocked his small body back and forth, making no sound. His face abruptly changed into a dead, slack expression. He lifted his finger to his throat, running it across his neck. I turned and started to run, grabbing Chuckles by the arm. He felt cold under my grasp. I could feel his thready heartbeat racing as his whole body trembled. He finally turned and stumbled forwards like a blind man and we got far away from the eldritch boy as quickly as we could. Chuckles, I said, out of breath. Slow down. We've gone far enough. No, we haven't, he said. We can never get far enough from that shit. Never. 
I'll see it in my nightmares forever. I said, I saw something before that boy appeared. I said, Zack had a number tattooed on his arm. 402202. Chuckles gave me a strange look. So what? He said. I pulled up my sleeve, showing him a tattoo I don't remember getting. It read 307227. His eyes went as big as saucers. Show me your right arm, I said. Pull your sleeve all the way up. He did. He also had a number tattooed there. 410778. What the fuck? He said, squinting and putting his arm right up to his eyes, as if he expected the numbers to fade like an optical illusion. I never got this tattoo. Why would I get numbers tattooed on my arm? I don't remember this tattoo either. I said, I never gotten a tattoo. I never planned on getting a tattoo. So how the hell do these numbers just appear on my arm suddenly? Why can't I remember getting it, or what it means? He just shook his head, confused. What is the last thing you remember before today? He asked, as he walked quickly along the street. Our rain boots left reverberating the thuds that echoed through the dancing trees. I kept glancing left and right, expecting to see more of these children with the bone-white faces and glowing eyes. I... I remember driving here, of course, I said. But I don't remember leaving. I couldn't remember yesterday or much of anything, really. I remembered my childhood, my family, and the house I grew up in, but after that, it was like my memory had a black hole eating away at it. This is weird, Chuckles said. My memory is blank, too. I, I remember school and, and growing up and everything, but then, as a teenager, it starts to turn black. You think someone drugged us or something? I bet if Zack was alive, he wouldn't be able to remember much either. I nodded. I've heard of the CIA using drugs to try to wipe people's memories during MK Ultra. I said. Maybe sodium thiopental and electroshock torture could wipe out memories. Or brainwashing. I wondered if I was laying on a bed in some cold, concrete room right now, with agents in black suits running wires into my brain. Perhaps this was all some sort of delirious nightmare. The forest opened up into a field on our left. I glanced over, constantly checking our sides and back for signs that we were being followed. But I didn't see mechanical snakes there or children with glowing eyes. There was a giant cube the color of black granite, about twenty feet high. The whipping wind blew against it. Waterfalls of rain poured down its surface, as if its exterior were made of some sort of writhing plastic. Its skin seemed to shiver. It jiggled, as if it had jelly inside, dancing and vibrating in the wind. Whoa, Chuckles said, walking slowly over to it. He put his hand down, deciding to touch its surface. I wouldn't do that, I said. But it was too late. He had made contact. Where he touched it, the blackness faded into a white, ghostly handprint. I thought I could see through the gelatinous skin in that spot, into the thick, jelly-like interior of this strange monolith. I walked up, repeating the experiment. I put my hand on the surface. It felt warm to the touch, and seemed to twitch under my hand, responding as if I had just picked up an angry, crawling spider. A chill ran down my back, but I didn't back away. I traced a random number on its surface. It faded away, and then a question mark appeared. A pale, curving line tracing down its skin. So I tried an experiment. Hi, I wrote on the surface. The letters burned there, white hot as lightning. Then they slowly faded. The black, granite-colored skin shivered in excitement. Hello. The letters appeared in front of us in computer script, etched across the gelatinous surface of the cube. They shone white, then quickly faded. Holy shit. Chuckles sat, looking over at me. It can talk. Or maybe someone is controlling it. 
Maybe this is like some Wizard of Oz shit, and there's a little man behind a curtain somewhere writing on a keyboard. I thought for a long moment, then wrote a simple question. Where am I? I wrote. The area called the Union, where the roads lead in circles, and the children of the dead feed on the living. The cube responded. What do the numbers on my arm mean? I wrote. You are all patients of a mental asylum. The cube responded. The letters were traced precisely in rapid order, flashing across eye level. All patients have numbers tattooed on their arms. This is why you can't remember a lot of things. This entire area is cut off from the rest of the world. Your memories were damaged in prior experiments. Why am I here? I wrote. The government finds people it deems worthless. Lifelong mental patients with no family or friends. They bring them here to feed the demon children of Union and to watch the results of the experiments. And what are you? I finally wrote, seeing the white lines tracing against the shivering skin of the cube. I am a supercomputer. It wrote. A combination of organic matter and circuits. My job is to record the data from the experiment. I will not help or harm you in any way, except for the transmission of knowledge which I am allowed to convey. If you survive the experiment, you will be allowed to leave. What is the way out? I wrote. Error. Code 99. You are not allowed to access this data. It wrote. How can I survive the experiment? I wrote. It repeated the message, saying. Error. Code 99. You are not authorized to access this data. I looked at Chuckles, and suddenly, my body felt a burning hot despite the cooling winds and the rain. I think we have a bit of a problem, I said, feeling trapped and terrified. Chuckles' haunted eyes mirrored my anxieties, and our fear built on each other's. I wondered if, right now, we were being watched. I figured the chances of that were 100%. We continued down the road. I wondered if we should try cutting through the forest. Perhaps the road just went in a circle, as the cube had said, or perhaps they just ended randomly. But Chuckles argued that we could move much faster on the road than through the thick brush and trees of the forest. The street curved ahead. The fog blew in thicker and wetter than before. The lightning started up again with a revitalized energy. In the nearby forest, trees cracked and split under the onslaught. Behind the shrill cacophony of the wind and thunder, I heard a woman screaming in panic and terror. It seems to go on and on. As Chuckles and I stopped dead in our tracks, a pretty young girl in her twenties, covered in blood and cuts, came sprinting around the corner. The rain mixed with the crimson streaming down on her face, arms and chest, washing it away into the chaotic currents streaming by her feet. Behind her, I saw one of those bone-white children with the glowing pale eyes. This one held a sharp, curving dagger in her little rotted hand. Blood dripped from the blade's tip. The girl laughed silently, her long, mummified hair flying out behind her. Her feet looked skinned, pieces of bone shone through the flesh like the first rays of sun streaming through a storm. The naked souls slapped lightly against the ground as she pointed at the woman and grinned. Her eyes gleamed brighter for a moment as she stopped, looking at Chuckles and me with a cocked head. She dropped the knife to her side, letting her arm hang loosely, swinging slightly back and forth. She's going to kill me! The woman screamed at us, running towards me. She collapsed in my arms. I felt the warm streams of her blood running over my hands as I held her. She cried, looking back at the grinning girl standing as still as a corpse on the road. Go away! Chuckles yelled, waving his arms at the girl as if she were simply a particularly pernicious bird. She just kept smiling, staring at us. My heart felt like ice as I met her blank, dead eyes. I looked down at the woman in my arms. I looked down at the woman in my arms, seeing a number tattooed on her naked arm. 
Her large blue eyes met mine. I saw her dilated pupils, the waves of adrenaline that shook her body like a hurricane. A raspy, sick voice rang out from behind me. I spun my head, seeing the boy had joined us now too. We were trapped between the two abominations. Hide and seek, hide and seek. It's raining. Time to play some games. He hissed. Run. You don't want to be caught. He pulled his small, decaying hand from behind his back, revealing a gleaming butcher's knife. He grinned. The girl started silently laughing. The tight, dead skin around her mouth cracking and ripping. Drops of black blood ran down her chin like oily tears. I hauled the woman up, and the three of us ran in a blind panic into the woods, hearing the diseased voice of the boy counting down from ten behind us. She slashed me over and over with the knife. The woman cried in pain. I saw flaps of skin hanging down from the cuts on her body. It made me sick to my stomach, but I kept pushing her forward. Even though she seemed weakened from the blood loss, all the slashes looked like surface wounds, as if they wanted to stretch out her suffering and death. We need to run, I hissed their gritted teeth. If they catch us, they will cut us all open and kill us slowly. I felt certain of that. Chuckles cried, his hysterical sobs coming out in choking gasps. I don't want to die, he said as he ran by my side. I don't want to die, and please, I'm so scared right now. He started repeating it like a mantra. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I heard him gasp as his foot caught a rock and he stumbled and fell. I looked back, seeing dozens of those children streaming through the woods like a plague of pale, grinning locusts. They all had blades and silently laughing expressions on their hairless, white faces. They were only a couple dozen feet behind us. They moved in a blur seeming to tiptoe on the leaves, creeping forward at a demonic speed. I knelt down, trying to force Chuckles to get up. A little boy was only a few steps behind us by now. I looked up just in time to see the gleaming knife coming down. I cried out as it sliced through my hand. A burning pain radiated up my arm. I stepped back as the silent boy laughed like a mime, pointing at me in a parody of exhilaration and gaiety. Chuckles whimpered like a child who had just glimpsed the monster from his nightmares crawling out under his bed. Please, no, he whispered as the knife came down again, piercing his eye and exploding through his brain. He froze like a puppet with its strings cut. The eye exploded in a slow trickle of thick gore. I took off running, my heart hammering as little feet stayed only a few feet behind me, dully thudding against the earth in quick, berserk steps. Up ahead, I saw the woman, but now she was staggering badly, wavering on her feet. She kept dripping blood as she ran frantically away. Finally, she started to slow. I caught up with her. Keep going, I said, though I knew she could not. Stark patches of ruddy color exploded on her pale, bloodless cheeks. Her bluish lips chattered. She shook and eventually just started stumbling forward, her many cuts still bleeding. I tried to grab her hand and pull her, but a little girl grabbed her shirt. At that moment, I had no alternative. I abandoned her and took off, knowing I would be the next to die. My heart broke for her as she pleaded in guttural tones for mercy. I knew that even I couldn't keep running forever. Yet these children, they seemed like they could. They never got tired. Their grins and silent laughter never faded. Just as my energy started to give out and I stumbled and fell, bright LED lights flashed through the woods a few dozen feet away. They pointed at my face, then at the creatures directly behind me. One of the rifles turned straight up to the sky and fired a warning shot into the air. I screamed, thinking they would shoot me next. The children all froze in place, their pale, blank eyes wide and curious, their heads cocked as they stared at the soldiers. Their smiles had faded into slack, rigor mortis expressions. 
I continued to crawl forward as men in black short suits and gas masks bounded forwards. Besides automatic rifles, the one in front also had cattle prods. I didn't know why at first. I started to crawl away from them. Get back! They screamed at the undead children, activating the cattle prod in the air with bright sparks of blue energy. The children hissed and spat, still looking down at me with hunger and bloodlust. And yet, after a few moments, the first of them turned and started slowly walking away, back towards the bodies of those who had fallen in our frantic sprint to live. I saw them gather around the body of the woman, kneeling down. They began to bite and suck at her pale skin. From far away, I watched as they drank her cooling blood. Congratulations, the man in the SWAT suit said, still holding the electrified cattle prod in one hand and a pistol in the other. He had an automatic rifle slung around his back. He stood in the front of the group, probably their leader. Behind him, another dozen men had gathered, silently watching me like faceless statues. You are the last survivor of Union. We are allowing you to leave. The gas mask muffled his voice. I felt like I was staring into the eyes of a fly. The circular black glass revealing nothing. Really? I said, backing up instinctively from the man, not trusting any of these figures. Thank God, Jesus Christ, I... But that was all I got to say before the cattle prod came up and I fell, writhing and kicking. Surges of electricity flowed through my muscles like the currents of an electric chair. I tried to scream, but my muscles seized up. I felt a needle bite into my neck and saw a dark hood come down over my face. An eternity seems to pass then, as black as the abyss and as cold as death. I woke up dumped in the downtown of our capital city. It was the middle of the night. I was alone, cold and stiff in some alleyway. Yet I was alive. Why? I didn't know at the time, but I think that they want to watch the long-term effects of their experiment. I've been staying on the move ever since. Sometimes I think I see black SUVs following me. Sometimes I think I see men with their cold, killer's eyes pretending not to watch me. But even worse than that, sometimes I catch a glimpse of another pair of eyes, and these ones dance and shine in the air like two dull lights glowing in the darkness of hell.